Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we are here for the first in a four-part series as we journey through a classic of the American English canon. Dalton, what are we doing? We are doing Ernest Hemingway's A Movable Feast. Little nonfiction here, so this is a little different than what we normally do, but it is Hemingway, so it's a good segue between the both worlds. Uh, Adrian, how far did we read this week? Do you have the exact page number, Andy? We read through 88. Through 88. Uh, The chapter titled, Ford, Maddox, Ford, and the Devil's Disciple. So, if you are reading along with us, we are going to have some spoilers throughout here, but this is pages 1 through 88. We're going to discuss it a little bit, uh, talk about what's going on, and I don't know, this may be a little different of a review because, you know, nonfiction. I think we're going to get a more of just, just some talking points about this as opposed to breaking it down. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 You're it's, excited about this. I, I am so torn on this text. I am so torn on this text. First off, I just want to put this out there. You enjoy this text greatly. I do. I, I don't so much. Okay. This is the proto-hipster text. Okay. Um, I woke up and I built the fire and it was good. Yeah. Okay. So I went out and I got some food and it was good. This is. Hemingway. I went out and I talked to some people and it was good. This has. Everything. I was running a story. Me, da, 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 da. It was good. This has everything going for it for me. It's Hemingway. It's in France. I fucking love France. And it's literally a man walking around and procrastinating and like worried that he's not going to be able to cut it as a writer yeah. when he's really the greatest fucking writer of all time. Yeah. Like it shows that internal struggle that like you never see. It's a rare book in that sense. It you is. never get something like this. You don't. There's no forward motion. Okay. It is more this is just a glimpse into a moment of Hemingway's life. Yeah. And like if, if I understand correctly like the story behind this is like he thought he lost the manuscript. And it was really just like in a trunk for like 20, 30 years or something. I don't know that. I do know that his first wife lost a great deal of his short stories. How dare her? How dare? Yeah, his first short, and it's even discussed in here, that Mm -hmm. um, she was, (laughs) for some reason, brought the photocopy, or not the photocopies, but the, the, uh, what's it called? The the copies of the text, uh, the typesets of the text, all of this stuff. Okay. Which was what you didn't do in these days because there was no backup hard drives, right? There was there were individual copies of texts. Okay. Uh, the note in the beginning here. Ernest started writing this book in Cuba in the autumn of 57, worked on it in Ohio, Idaho in the winter of 58, 59, took it with him to Spain. Uh, we went there in April of 59, brought it back to Cuba, then to catch him later in the fall, and finished the book in 1960. Uh, after having put it aside to write another book, uh, he made some revisions to the book in 60. It concerns the years of 1921 through 1926 in Paris. Right. So what is the it, copyright? It, copyright of 1964. Yeah. So he finished it, and four years later, I guess he's like, oh, well, I still got this. Let's publish it. Yeah. But it's interesting. So what we get here is just like the best breakdown we get. We get a glimpse of Hemingway's life in Paris. Uh, we see his first interactions with Gertrude Stein. Uh, we get to see him doing a little bit of some horse betting bumbling around as a wannabe writer, and we're really left here with a, I don't know, kind of a tired, downtrodden Hemingway. Uh, You know, it's not as glamorous as you think. He's talking about, you know, it's expensive to live in Paris, and he's not making a lot of money. He can't pay some of his bills at, like, the library. Yeah, but even then, expensive to live there doing what? He's a writer. Yeah, you couldn't do that today. That's one of my <laughs> points. That's my first point. This life doesn't exist anymore. You cannot survive like this. Right. It really is. It, it's a moment in history that's gone. You're never going to get this again. Yeah. Where you can literally just be like, you know what? I'm going to spend a few years in Paris. <laughs> and uh, I'm just going to get me a nice little cheap apartment. You know, it's fine. I don't need a lot of money. And I'm just going to go to the cafes. I'm going to drink and I'm going to write. And I'm going to make it a thing. Yeah. Doesn't exist. Yeah. I, I, am, I am so torn on this text so far because, like I say, there's no driving force. There's okay. no forward motion. Okay. Um, and so much of it's just, you know, I woke up that morning and I ate some oranges in front of the fire because they were good. Right? And I can't stand that. I, I hate reading that. Even in Hemingway's gorgeous writing, I hate reading that because it's pointless. But so much of this 
reminds me of my days in grad school. Okay. Where I had said, you know what? Fuck the world. I'm doing this thing. I'm setting aside a couple of years of my life and I'm accruing a whole lot of student loan debt, but I'm going to be a writer. And I would wake up, go get something very quick and cheap to eat and head to the coffee house and write for hours. And I loved that about that point in my life. Okay. So it is reinvigorating from that point. But even in that, I am torn on this text because it fills me with this ire and this rage and this anxiety that I am no longer doing that. Okay. That I, I, I no longer have the time to just say, you know what? Today, I'm going to write a short story. I, I can't do that anymore. Okay. I wake up. I I, I gotta wake. I, I wake up hours before I go to work because I work the overnights. Um, so much of my time, like, like I'm not complaining, but so much of my time is dedicated to the channel. True. Um, all of these sorts of things that I I I I doubt very heavily I'll ever get back to that place in my life again. It's hard to make time. And this is, like I said, this is a rare glimpse into this idea of uh, the writer. And it's a very romantic notion, the idea of, you know, the, the lofty writer who just, you know, kind of goes to the cafes and writes all day and he's going to be fine. Uh, but, but it is, it, that's what everybody wants. That's who everybody who sits down and puts pen to paper wants. They want to be this Hemingway. Oh, yeah. They do. Yeah. And it's amazing to actually read it and, like, know it happened. And know that you're arguably one of the greatest writers of all times. So, well, there was a period of life where he was like, well, shit. Yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm just trying to figure it out. Uh, I will say, though, one thing I thought you would enjoy about this is this is riddled with good quotes. Riddled. Go on. Do not worry. You have always written before, and you will write now. All you have to do is write one true sentence. Write the truest sentence you know. That's an Adrian quote if I've ever seen one. Where does it go? <laughs> doesn't matter. I always worked until I had something done, and I always stopped when I knew what was going to happen next. That is an Adrian quote if I've ever seen yeah, one. It's sort of a, it, 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 it is sort of like on writing by Stephen King. I'm not done. When I was writing, it was necessary for me to read after I had written. If you kept thinking about it, you would lose the thing that you were writing before you could go on with it the next day. It was necessary to get exercise, to be tired in the body, and it was very good to make love with whom you loved. These are gorgeous quotes. These are gorgeous writer's quotes. Yeah. They're all over the place. And I have read this one before, so like I have my pink highlights from like the first time I went through it, my yellow highlights from this time around. I love this book. I know you do. There's so much going on with it. There's nothing going on. And that's the best part. Like, there's so much happening and nothing's happening. It's wonderful. This is Hemingway going against some of his own best writing advice. Do not confuse movement for action. There is so much internally going on here that we see with, like, Hemingway struggling. Like, but it's not even really going on. But is it, it is. Is it? And that's what makes it good. It's just this little slice of life that you're never going to get with anyone else. It's magic. And we have, the, this is the introduction of the idea of uh, the lost generation. We get that. The, the birth of the lost generation with Gertrude Stein here. Uh, which, as much as I love Gertrude Stein, every time I read about her, I'm like, eh, maybe I don't like her as much yeah, as I thought I did. Yeah, not, 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 not portrayed in the greatest fashion. Man, Gertrude Stein, you pretentious asshole. Well, write the one truest sentence you know, right? Like, you, you don't get the feeling that Hemingway is lying about anybody to make them sound better here. It's fair. Uh, he's, even, he's not even lying about himself and giving himself the blame in his relationship going bad. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, he's not saying that dirty woman, you know. He's saying, yeah, I was... I was kind of a jerk, <laughs> you know? And, and then we get the scene with Ford Maddox Ford where he's just painted in awful fashion. That Hemingway's sitting there at a diner and he goes, oh, there's Ford Maddox Ford. Don't make eye contact, don't make eye contact, don't make eye contact. <laughs> and Ford Maddox Ford comes over, Hemingway, shit. <laughs> and that's the beautiful thing here. And, like, I, it really, like, when I first, like, made all these connections, like, when you're first getting into the other uh, writing world, all these artists hung out together. Yeah. Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Joyce, Ezra Picasso. Pound, Picasso, Ford Maddox Ford. Uh, it, 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 if you've ever seen the film A Midnight in Paris, yeah. this is like the screenplay for A Midnight in Paris. Yeah. It's gorgeous. And there's so much, like when you get to the uh, chapters with Hemingway and Fitzgerald together, holy shit, man. 
See, I've never read this before, so... It's a fucking riot. Yeah. It is gold. It is pure comic gold. Yeah. And, like, I, it, if that alone doesn't sell this book for you, I, nothing will. I'm sorry. And that's that's the one that... Well, uh, it is nice for me to see the story behind Up in Michigan. You okay. You know, in, in all of these, these short stories. But um, the one thing that's really surprising me here is how funny Hemingway is. I'm not really used to funny Hemingway. I'm used to Hemingway setting up a little bit of a situational comedy once or twice okay. in his short stories. But they're not situational comedies that you can laugh at. They're situational comedies where you go, oh, that sucks. Just wait. This, this scene, these scenes with um, Gertrude Stein, where even Hemingway, the mansplainer of all mansplainers, is sitting there and Gertrude Stein is telling, no, Hemingway, you're doing it wrong. And as I do Gertrude Stein, I'm putting on the Hemingway voice. <laughs> but uh, Gertrude Stein saying all these things to Hemingway, telling him how, no, 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 no. Sit down, boy. Do it this way, you know? Okay. Um, and we even get that, we get that scene, um, the conversation on 19 uh, through 21. I don't know if I've got anything marked to actually, yeah, I didn't mark anything to actually talk about. But basically what's going on there is Gertrude Stein, who was a lesbian, talking about the dirty act of homosexual sex and how all gay men are so ashamed that they have to be promiscuous and they have to hide their act and it's disgusting and it's filthy and all of these things. It's like, wow, you know, like... It's a side of her you never thought you'd see. Yeah, and well, well, and I think a lot of it is in today's world. Um, the only people who are ever painted as judgmental and morally condescending and things are straight white men. Okay, like those are the the morally reprehensible people are straight white men because they judge everyone. This is someone in what we today define as gay culture, right? who's making that judgment on gay men. And it's just one of those eye-opening things that... Um, I, I think one of the... The only thing I can really think to... to talk about... To, to illuminate this sort of thing is from my own childhood. Um, racism of difference, right? So a lot of... People, a lot of white people who are racist in a specific way say that there's black people and then there's the N word. Okay. Right? And that's, look, I'm not racist, but there's black people and then there's the N word, right? I like black people, I don't like the N word. Okay. Um, now, why that is racist is because you're saying that the faults in someone that you define as an N word. Are inherent to their race and it's the same way as saying well there's white people and there's white trash well no there's good people and there's bad people um, the race doesn't play into that at all it's just a difference in melanin in your skin right um, but there's also I remember so I had a lot of black friends growing up who believed the same thing there's black people and there's the n-word okay. and there's white people and there's white trash this is it's so strange through today's prism to see gay culture as fractured, okay. right? When, when you just look at the big... Now, obviously, uh, I'm, I'm close to gay people, I'm close to trans people, I'm close to lesbians, and that's absolutely still real. There, there's absolutely fraction, like it, just like any group, mm -hmm. right? But it's so strange in today's climate um, that LGBTQ plus is not a group of unified people. Okay. You know? and, and it's, I've never through literature seen this discrimination of lesbians against gays. Okay. I, th I think that's the big interesting thing of this is uh, it, at its base level is you're getting a glimpse of people who you know 
Like, everybody knows Gertrude Stein. Everybody knows Gertrude Stein's relationship to Hemingway. But you get a, a, a real first-person glimpse at, like, them. Just bare. Not being, you know, the literati. Not being right. Gertrude Stein. But just, it was my friend Gertrude. So, like, good and bad with both of that. But uh, it, it's damn interesting that you get the opportunity to see this. It really feels like you're there in the story. And like I said, you really enjoy the Ford Maddox Ford part. Yeah. Oh, just wait. Because yeah. we still have Ezra Pound. We still have James Joyce. We still have Scott Fitzgerald. Yeah. They're all coming in. They're all there hanging out in Paris. I'm excited to get to Ezra Pound. Okay. Because Ezra Pound is someone with whom I have always been sort of tertiarily interested, but not interested enough to really read just to read about. Okay. We did get a little mention of Ezra when we were talking uh, with Gertrude. She was angry at Ezra Pound because he had sat down too quickly on a small, fragile, and doubtlessly uncomfortable chair that it is quite possible he had never been given on purpose and had either cracked or broken it. Uh, so we get a little smack talk on Ezra from uh, Gertrude's standpoint here. I think you read that slightly wrong. It was possible that he had been given that on purpose. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, but no, it, it, Ezra was a big influence on Hemingway. So it, it, you're actually going to see that relationship. You're actually going to get a chance to see what Hemingway realistically thought about Ezra. It, it's amazing. Yeah, there's the two quotes from Hemingway that are often thrown up in, in this conversation. Hemingway said that Ezra, Ezra Pound taught me to write and I taught him to box. And he also said... My writing is nothing and my boxing is everything. <laughs> so um, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's going to be, I'm very interested to see where that goes and how that develops. Because Ezra Pound was a weird dude. Uh, Ezra Pound in World War, do you know about anything about Ezra Pound? A little, not much. You know his involvement in World War II? No. Uh, he was, he went to Italy and worked for El Duce, really. Um, uh, El, what was his name? El, 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 I'm, I'm butchering. I, I can't remember right now. But basically, he was a mouthpiece for that government. Okay. Which was an Axis power. He went over there and spoke for them. And, yeah... And that's the thing. I, I, you're going to actually see the real man, Ezra Pound, in this. Yeah. And if you want to talk about weird guys, just fucking wait till we get to Scott Fitzgerald. Yeah. Because, like, everybody thinks, you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald, he wrote The Ga Great Gatsby. He must be, you know, so suave and debonair. No. He is a hot mess. Oh, yeah. And it is comic gold. Like, I'm so excited for you to explain. Like, we should just cancel everything we're doing and finish this right now. Yeah. I love this book. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, I, I, there's a lot that plays into it. I finished my undergrad in France. So, like, all this beautiful, you know, Paris, France, the scenery, walking around the streets, I dig it. Yeah. Because it reminds me of that, and I really enjoyed my time there. Because that was my period of time where I got away. I wasn't working. I was just going to school and living. And it was fucking glorious. It's something you're never going to get back. Right. Very much like you're never going to get this Paris back. Uh, you're never going to have a point in time where like all the great artists of a time all congregated for no reason. And just got together and created. And it was... And it's so strange because normally you would think if all these people get together, they're going to create the same things. But they didn't. Nope. They all found their own voices through that. Now they were a very pared. It was a very pared down voice, I will say. Um, when you look at Picasso, very strange stuff, but not ornate, really. Okay. Hemingway's writing, not ornate, really. Gritty. F. Scott Fitzgerald. I wouldn't describe F. Scott Fitzgerald as ornate. Um, there's. There are surplu sur superfluities throughout Fitzgerald. Okay. Um, but it is not uh, James Joyce. When you really look at what's going on there, it's streamlined to an extent. Like, there's, there's a lot of truth being told there. Um, but it, it was an artistic movement. Like, I, I don't know how to put this in, like, context of what this would be. It, 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 it's all the names of the time. It, it's everybody. It's just like, I, I'm just going to start slinging like popular names right now. It's like if a fucking Stephen King, J.K. Rowling, uh, George R.R. R. Martin, Steven Spielberg, and Eminem 
all were like, you know what? We should all go to Detroit and just live there for a few just years. Hang out, man. Just hang out and see what happens. Oddly enough, this lifestyle you could probably still get in Detroit. You probably could. Yeah. You probably could. You just show up in Detroit yeah. and, and exist. I have a nice little apartment. I started a fire in it and kept warm. And no one asked for rent. It's fine. It's no big deal. No big deal. Did be- you know, so there is. Did you know that there? When I was in, in going back to grad school, when I was in grad school, one of my one of my professors brought up. Apparently, they were trying to get artists to Detroit. Um, I think we've talked about just this. to kind of collect them. There. Yes, and, and it was like free living. Yeah, something like that, and and keep them there. And everybody in my class was like, "Holy shit, that sounds awesome!" But Detroit, <laughs> and my professor goes, "Yeah, Adrian could probably get along there." <laughs> what do you mean? We should go to Detroit. Let's just, let's just uproot and go to Detroit and see if we make it through. Uh, and as weird as it sounds, like I said, there's not a lot we can talk about uh, from a literary standpoint because there's, it's, it's not literature. It's nonfiction. I have a feeling that the series is just going to be storytelling around writing. It is. And that's a great thing, though, because this book doesn't it's definitely exist. A pace. Uh, it, it's refreshing. And even when Hemingway is just writing about not writing, he's successful in it. It works. Uh, and I, honestly, I would have loved, I wish there was a sequel to this where it's like Hemingway's time in Cuba. Like, we just call it a bountiful move. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> I would have loved to have read something into that. But, like, unfortunately, as far as we know, non-existent. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's weird. It, it, this w- was written 30 years after it happened-ish. I, it would just basically be like, you know, once you're established, just going back and writing about what got you there. When if you were we still ever, struggling. If we ever hit 100,000 subscribers and... We're full time status on YouTube, and we wrote about 2016. Yeah, you know, yeah, uh, that's what it would be. Uh, but I think we're going to get a lot of interesting stuff going on with this. We're going to see a lot of famous authors come into play here, and we're going to see what they were really like. And hot damn, is it a time? Yeah, because writers by nature are not usually social creatures, and we are putting them in a very, very social situation and just watching them collapse. Well, there's another Hemingway quote. Uh, the only person lonelier than the writer is the suicide. Um, you know, I've got a book around here someplace called The Hemingway. I think a, I bought that for you. A strange little fellow bought that for me a, a long time ago. And it's just all this manly stuff about, about Hemingway. But, okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, what would we call that book about stri- the, a move, the Movable Least? The movable lease. I like it. Um, I like it. <laughs> Immovable lease because I couldn't afford to live anywhere else. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> but uh, no, it's we talked about this a little bit in the uh, the sun also rises, which is one of our most popular reviews. Yeah. Uh, people really dig the sun also rises. Uh, that again was an existence that is, is not there anymore. We talked about it with Kerouac's on the road. You don't get that lifestyle anymore. So this really captures a moment in history beautifully that is gone. I mean, without something like this, you would have never been able to experience it. So it, I think this book is absolutely valuable well, in, in the greater canon of literature. So we're both coming to this text and identifying with it from different times. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that is, obviously that's one of the, the selling points on literature is that everyone gets to identify with it in their own way and take something from it. Mm-hmm. Um, it also reminds me of having a writer's group. You know, when, when, when I ran a writer's group for several years um but i i will not i will not say that it does not have value to me I, i'm just not enjoying it as as i as i would hope to we'll see where we go because i think i think it's going to redeem itself for you i think there's enough in there that uh it's going to be worth your time i hope it is at least so you are often the reason that we have to stop production on something, right? True. Um, so we could call the story of 2016 when you left the removable cease. You're still on that, aren't you? You're still trying bit, to come yeah, up with that yeah, title. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm still trying to... Why are you so mad right, right now? No, I, I don't know. I just, it felt like the right tone to give that. <laughs> uh, shit. Again, I had something I was going to say about this book, and like now that you've mentioned that, I'm like, no, never mind. I'm done with it. I don't want to talk about anything. The removable cease. The removable cease. <laughs> you Son quit the of channel. A bitch. <laughs> <laughs> but you're you're right that there are there are meta moments in here. Did you get it? No, no. I, I was just agreeing with you. Uh, 
Uh, no, there there really is, and like it, it's it's fascinating to really see this from Hemingway's uh, point of view because at this point in time, I mean, he didn't know if he had what it took. And there's even a one point here. He's like, you know what? I should really write a novel. <laughs> that's what I need to do, but I just don't think I can. Yeah, that's another thing that I think a lot of uh, a lot of writers will identify. A lot of writers who consider themselves auteurs will identify with this text through. Yeah. Because, especially in today, like back then, you can still make a living selling short stories. True. You're not doing that today. The short story is dead. Even George Saunders said, well, fuck it, I gotta write a book. Gotta write a book. <laughs> so, the first time I read, this is my second read-through. The first time I read this, I literally sat down, like, you know what, I'm finally gonna do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on a movable feast. And I read the whole goddamn thing in a sitting. Really? Yeah, I fucking corked a bottle of wine and sat and drank and read this whole fucking thing. Yeah. So it is interesting reading it from a more keen eye at this point. Oh my God, that quote about Scott Fitzgerald is beautiful. It is the best fucking quote ever. You had something to say, I think. Um, well, I, I found I found what is quite possibly the Dalton selling point for this novel. <clears throat> but Paris was a very old city, and we were young, and nothing was simple there. Not even poverty, nor sudden money, nor the moonlight. Nor right and wrong, nor the breathing of someone who lay beside you in the moonlight. You have Paris once, Mm -hmm. moonlight twice, poverty, sudden money. You get everything that's the Dalton selling point. It's perfect. Give me all the shit you want. Even when he's talking about anything in this book, Hemingway, he just has these little golden Hemingway quotes that are perfect. It was all part of the fight against poverty that you never win except by not spending. There's your entire... That's like every finance book ever written summed up in one line (laughs) from Ernest Hemingway. Quit spending all that goddamn money! As he wanders around (laughs) buying things. Like, I'm going to go to the cafe today. I'm going to go to the bar today. Well, he sells a short story and goes to the the track. (laughs) And and then there's just so much... uh, so much Bukowski there, too. There is. You know? I will let you know right now, if I ever sell any form of writing, uh, make a decent profit from writing, that first check... Straight to the casinos. I will blow the entire fucking thing just because I can. It has to be done. Yeah. Anyway, uh, where are we reading to next week, Adrian? Do we have that lined out uh, yet? I, I, we do not have that lined out yet. That's what Damn I'm here for, to make this as inconvenient uh, as possible. 88, so 160-ish. We will read through... We will read up until, holy crap, how long is this chapter? We will read through 176 until the chapter Hawks Do Not Share. But we are reading through the chapter that is very long here. The Scott Fitzgerald Scott chapter. Fitzgerald, yeah. Ah. Uh, so we'll, we'll get Scott Fitzgerald. You're going to break it up because Hawks Do Not Share, that's the one, man. That's the one. But we'll That's get it. Okay. We'll get a taste of Fitzgerald next week and we'll continue forward. Through 176, through uh, Scott Fitzgerald, uh, that is what we have for this this episode of a four-part series as we journey through A Movable Feast by, by Ernest Hemingway. Um, three-part read-along and then the review of the book, which it'll be interesting to see how we do here. Um, as we've never done nonfiction in that fashion before. Uh, hit the like button if you like this sort of thing. Subscribe if you have not already. Hit the bell if you would like to be notified when we post things. And if you were in, in, if you would like to help us create more content here on Strip Cover Lit, there's a link to our Patreon as always to be found in the description below. Hemingway's just trying to, you know, drink and keep on with his day. Fitzgerald gets slammed and has to go call... Yeah, thinks he's dying, has to call Zelda. It's amazing. Amazing! 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 To go call. Yeah, to go call.